Hey, it's Mark. What's going on? Get in here, sit down. We got work to do. So in class today, we're going to take a deeper look at the freeze out of the mid-major universities by the Power Five. This period, let's look at the old BCS system between 1998 and 2014. Let's see how the power schools avoided embarrassment at the hands of two BCS busters in 2009. Let's look at Boise State and TCU in the 2010 Fiesta Bowl. Let's go rogue. You know, for most of college football history, the national championship was chosen by a vote of sports writers and coaches. Very early on, the bowls were established. The Rose Bowl invited a team from the Midwest, the Big, the Big Ten champion, to come to Pasadena, bring 30,000 fans along out of the snow of Ohio or Michigan, uh, to come to Pasadena and have some fun in Southern California. Uh, their communities followed with their own bowl games. The Orange Bowl in Miami, Sugar Bowl in New Orleans, the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Conferences then agreed to contracts with the Bulls. The Big Ten and the Pac-10 and the Rose, the Big Eight with the Orange, the SEC with the Sugar Bowl, the Southwest Conference with the Cotton. In 1998, the schools all agreed to fall under the Bowl Championship Series, or the BCS. The six power conferences create a system where the two best teams would play in the BCS championship. A formula is created using a mix of human polls and computer polls, and the top two teams in the BCS poll would meet in the championship game, which would rotate between the four selected big money bowls, the orange, the rose, the sugar, and the fiesta. The other three bowls would host their regular tie-ins unless they were in the championship. The Rose, hosting the champion of the Big Ten and the Pac-10. The Orange Bowl, hosting the ACC champion. Uh, the Sugar Bowl, hosting, hosting the SEC champion. And the Fiesta Bowl, hosting the Big 12 champion. The Big East champion would fill one of the remaining spots in the Orange, the Sugar, or the Fiesta. And since one of the bowls was the BCS championship, there were usually two at-large spots. A bowl could choose any team that had at least nine wins and was ranked in the top 14 in the BCS. A team from a non-automatic qualifying conference had to finish in the top six of the BCS poll to make a BCS game. Good luck, you non-AQ guys. Winning a conference championship didn't necessarily mean that a team was good. The 2002 Sugar Bowl featured ACC champion, 9-4 and four and 14th ranked Florida State. The 1998 Orange Bowl had the Big East champion, 8-3 and three and 15th ranked Syracuse. The 99 Rose Bowl had the Pac-10 champion, Stanford, which was 8-3 and three and ranked number 22. 2000 featured the Big Ten champion, 17th ranked Purdue in the Rose Bowl, and 11th ranked Notre Dame, getting smoked by Oregon State in the Fiesta. Then came 2004. The University of Utah was the conference champion of the non-AQ Mountain West, finished the season 11-0 and ranked number six in the BCS. Oh, and coached by some guy named Urban Meyer. Hmm, should we put him up against a top 10 team? Number eight, Virginia Tech in the Orange Bowl? Number 13, Michigan in the Rose? Number four, Texas in the Fiesta? No, they get the Big East champion. Number 21, University of Pittsburgh. 35 to seven, Utes. Well, Pitt was number 21. They weren't that good. They were the sacrificial lamb. The real power schools were safe from embarrassment. In 2005, the BCS was expanded to 10 teams. All four bowls would play on or about New Year's Day, and number one and number two in the BCS poll would meet a week later at one of the four BCS bowl sites. The additional game gave the non-AQs another opportunity. Boise State took advantage in 2006, winning the Western Athletic Conference, finishing 12-0 and ranked number eight. They were selected by the Fiesta Bowl to play number 10 Oklahoma. Following the 2009 season, Utah returned to the BCS. Undefeated, Mountain West champions and ranked number six. The Utes were selected to play in the Sugar Bowl, this time against Alabama, who had just lost the SEC championship game to Florida. 
Alabama was favored by 10 points. Utah scored on its first three drives and beat the Tide 31 to 17. In the Poinsettia Bowl played two weeks earlier in San Diego, Mountain West runner-up TCU and WAC champion Boise State played. They were ranked number 11 and number 9 respectively, which was a, actually a better matchup ranking-wise than the BCS's Orange Bowl, which had number 19 Virginia Tech of the ACC and number 12 Cincinnati of the Big East. The next season, 2009, saw two non-AQ schools become BCS eligible. Previous BCS buster, Boise State, which was undefeated, WAC champion, and sixth ranked in the nation, and Texas Christian University, who was also undefeated, the Mountain West champion, and ranked number four. At this point in BCS history, the non-AQs were three and one against the automatic qualifying schools. The only loser out of the non-AQs was Hawaii in the 2008 Sugar Bowl. Utah had embarrassed both Pitt and Alabama. Boise had beaten Oklahoma. Would two non-AQ teams beat two power conference teams in 2009? God forbid! That would bring down the entire system. Bring about a seismic shift in the college football landscape. The WAC and the Mountain West? The Fiesta Bowl got to be the sacrificial lamb to the system. They chose to take Boise and TCU, saving the AQ schools from the possibility of any further embarrassment by mid-majors. People in Boise and Fort Worth were pissed. I'm still pissed. The game was referred to by some as the Quarantine Bowl, others as the Separate But Equal Bowl, the BCS Kids Table. Some called for a boycott, but the two teams proved to be above that. What could the BCS have done? Here was the schedule of the 2010 BCS games. How'd this come about? Obviously, the BCS Championship was set with number one Alabama and number two Texas. The Rose Bowl took its traditional tie-ins with number seven Oregon and number eight Ohio State. The Orange Bowl, with its tie-in with the ACC, took number nine Georgia Tech. The Sugar Bowl got to take the first of the remaining schools. They took Florida, keeping its ties with the SEC. The Fiesta then took Texas Christian to replace Texas, which was in the national championship. The Orange Bowl now got to choose an opponent for ACC champion Georgia Tech from number six Boise, number three Cincinnati, and number 10 Iowa. I'm trying to put myself in the mind of the Orange Bowl committee. They passed on number three Cincinnati, which is quizzical. Perhaps they thought Cincinnati was overrated as Big East champion and ranked number three in the nation. Perhaps they didn't see a national draw from the school or that their fans didn't travel well. Now, the choice between Iowa and Boise State. Does Iowa draw better nationally than Boise? Or did Iowa travel better? Or was it just the fact that Iowa is closer to Miami and the committee thought that they could get more fans from Iowa than they could from Idaho? For whatever reason, I have my theory, they took Iowa. Number nine versus number six just seems that much better than number nine versus number 10. With the choice between Boise and Cincinnati, the Fiesta Bowl to Boise, creating the non-AQ bowl that it seems like the BCS wanted. The Power Five, Quarantine Bowl. The 2010 Orange Bowl scored a Nielsen rating of 6.2, which translates into 8.1 million viewers. I would guess mostly from Georgia and Iowa. The Fiesta Bowl, in spite of having two lower tier teams, scored a Nielsen rating of 8.5, which translates into 11.2 million viewers. If they'd given the fans what they wanted, a non-AQ versus AQ matchup, Iowa in the Fiesta Bowl, and Boise in the Orange against Georgia Tech, the intrigue, the interest, the number of viewers, I suspect, would have been much higher. And isn't that what we want in college sports? <laughs> you ever seen a group of people go to such great lengths to protect their privileges? Some conferences are now requiring that their teams limit the number of games they play against mid-majors. Over the past 10 years, the Power Five conferences have been negotiating with their bowl partners to lock out 
the other teams from the group of five. I remember being in the stadium watching Fresno State beat Virginia in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl in 2004. In 2010, there were 12 bowl games that matched Power 5 schools against mid-majors. Next year, in 2020, there will only be seven. For the past 10 years, the Las Vegas Bowl featured the champion of the Mountain West against the number six team from the Pac-12. This next year, the Vegas Bowl is going to feature a 6-6 six and six team from the Pac-10 and a 7-5 and five team from, like, the big XII. That'll be followed on ESPN by the Winnebago Recreational Vehicle Bowl featuring a 6-6 six and six team from the Big Ten and a 6-6 six and six team from the ACC. I can't wait. Well, what do you think? Is it my imagination? Or are the Power Five conferences doing everything that they can to maintain their privilege, to freeze out the middies? Is that necessarily bad if they are? Let me know in the comments below. And hit the like button if you like the video. You know, if you enjoy history, I talk about history through sports, obviously, TV, movies, music. It would be awesome if you would subscribe to my channel, History Teacher Gone Rogue. I hope you had fun. I hope you are entertained while you were quarantined. I hope you learned something along the way. I had fun, but I'll quit my day job. And uh, the next time you're looking on YouTube for a game that they played from, uh, like, 2001, we're a mid-major. Beat a Power 5 school. Remember me. I'm Mark Hedden. I'm a history teacher. And I've got a room.